don't just read ncert listen it and feel it physics textbook of class 12th part 2 chapter 9 ray optics and optical instrument narrated by isna rafat khan introduction nature has endowed the human eye or retina with the sensitivity to detect electromagnetic waves within a smaller range of electromagnetic spectrum Electromagnetic radiation belongs to this region of a spectrum wavelength of about 400 nanometer to 750 nanometer is called light it is mainly through the light and the sense of vision that we know and interpret the world around us there are two things that we can intuitively mention about light from the common experience first that it travels with enormous speed and second that it travels in a straight line It took some time for the people to realize that the speed of light is finite and measurable. Its presently accepted value in vacuum is c is equals to 2.9979245 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. For many purpose, it suffices to take c is equals to 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. The speed of light in vacuum is the highest speed attainable in nature. The intuitive notion that light travels in a straight line seems to contradict what we have learned in chapter 8 that light is an electromagnetic wave of wavelength belonging to the visible part of the spectrum. How to reconcile the two facts? The answer is that wavelength of the light is very small compared to the size of the ordinary object that we encounter commonly. In this situation as you will learn in chapter 10 a light wave can be considered to travel from one point to another along a straight line joining them the path is called the ray of light and a bundle of such rays constitute a beam of light in this chapter we consider the phenomena of reflection refraction dispersion of light using the ray picture of light using the basic laws of reflection and refraction We shall study the image formation by the plane and spherical reflecting and refracting surface. We then go on to learn and describe the construction and working of some important optical instruments including the human eye. Particle model of light. Newton's fundamental contribution to mathematics, mechanics and gravitation often blind us to his deep experimental and theoretical study of light. He made pioneering contributions in the field of optics. He further developed the corpuscular model of the light proposed by Descartes. It presumes that light energy is concentrated in tiny particles called corpuscles. He further assumed that corpuscles of the light were the massless elastic particles. With his understanding of mechanics, he could come up with a simple model of reflection and refraction. It is a common observation that the ball bouncing from the smooth plane surface obeys the law of reflection. When this is an elastic collision, the magnitude of the velocity remains same. As the surface is a smooth, there is no force acting parallel to the surface, so the component of momentum in this direction also remains the same. Only the component perpendicular to the surface, that is the normal component of momentum, gets reversed in reflection. Newton argued that smooth surface-like mirrors reflect the corpuscles in a similar manner. In order to explain the phenomena of refraction, Newton postulated that the speed of corpuscle was greater in water or glass than in air however later on it was discovered that the speed of light is less in water or glass than in air in the field of optics newton the experimenter was greater than the newton the theorist he himself observed many phenomena which were difficult to understand in terms of particle nature of light for example the colors observed due to a thin film of oil on water property of partial reflection of light is yet another such example everyone who has looked into the water in a pond sees the image of the face in it but also sees the bottom of the pond newton argued that some of the corpuscles which fall on the water get reflected and some get transmitted but what property will distinguish these two kinds of corpuscles newton has to postulate some kind of unpredictable chance phenomena which decided 
whether an individual corpuscles would be reflected or not. In explaining other phenomena, however, the corpuscles were presumed to behave as if they are identical. Such a dilemma does not occur in the wave picture of light. An incoming wave can be divided into weaker waves at the boundary between air and water. Reflection of light by spherical mirrors We are familiar with the laws of reflection. The angle of reflection, the angle between the refracted ray and the normal to the reflecting surface or the mirror equals the angle of incidence, that is the angle between incident ray and the normal. Also that the incident ray, reflected ray and the normal to the reflecting surface at a point of incident lie in the same plane. These laws are valid at each point on any reflecting surface, whether plane or curve. However, we shall restrict our discussion to the special case of the curved surface, that is a spherical surface. The normal in this case is taken to be the normal to the tangent to the surface at the point of incidence. That is, the normal is along the radius, the line joining the center of the curvature of the mirror to the point of incidence. We have already studied that the geometric center of the spherical mirror is called its pole, while that of a spherical lens is called its optical center. The line joining the pole and the center of curvature of the spherical mirror is known as the principal axis. In the case of the spherical lens, the principal axis is the line joining the optical center with the principal focus, as you will see later. The sign convention to drive the relevant formula of reflection by the spherical mirrors and the refraction by spherical lenses, we must first draw up a sign convention for measuring distance. In this book, we shall follow the Cartesian sign convention. According to this convention, all distances are measured from the pole of the mirror or the optical center of the lens. The distance is measured in the same direction as incident light is taken as positive and those measured in the direction opposite to the direction of incident light are taken as negative. The heights measured upwards with respect to x-axis and normal to the principal axis of the mirror are taken as positive. The height measured downwards are taken as negative. With a common accepted convention, it turns out that a single formula for spherical mirrors and a single formula for a spherical lens can handle all different cases. Focal Length of Spherical Mirrors Figure 9.3 shows what happens when a parallel beam of light is incident on A, a concave mirror, and B, a convex mirror. We assume that the rays are paraxial, that is, they are incident at points close to the pole P of the mirror and make small angles with the principal axis. The reflected rays converge at point F on the principal axis of the concave mirror. For a convex mirror, the reflected rays appear to diverge from a point F on its principal axis. The point F is called the principal focus of the mirror. If the parallel paraxial beam of the light were incident, making some angle with the principal axis, the reflected rays would converge or appear to diverge from a point in plane through F normal to the principal axis. This is called the focal plane of the mirror. The distance between the focus and the pole P of the mirror is called the focal length of the mirror, denoted by F. We now show that F is equals to R by 2, where R is the radius of curvature of the mirror. The geometry of reflection of an incident ray is shown in figure 9.4. Let C be the center of curvature of the mirror. Consider a ray parallel to the principal axis striking the mirror at M. Then the CM will be perpendicular to the mirror M. Let theta be the angle of incidence and MD be perpendicular from M on the principal axis. Then angle MCP is equal to theta and angle MFP is equal to 2 theta. Now tan theta is equal to MD by CD and tan 2 theta is equal to MD by FD. For a small theta, which is true for paraxial rays, tan theta is approximately equal to theta and tan 2 theta is equal to 2 theta. Therefore, it gives that FD is equal to CD by 2. Now, for a small theta, the point D is very close to the point P. Therefore, FD is equal to F and CD is equal to R. Then this equation gives F is equal to R by 2. 
द मिरर इक्वेशन इफ द रेज एमिनेटिंग फ्रॉम अ पॉइंट एक्चुअली मेड एट अनदर पॉइंट आफ्टर रिफ्लेक्शन एंड और रिफ्रैक्शन दैट पॉइंट इज कॉल्ड द इमेज ऑफ द फर्स्ट पॉइंट द इमेज इज रियल इफ द रेज एक्चुअली कन्वर्स टू द पॉइंट इट इज वर्चुअल इफ द रेज डू नॉट एक्चुअली मेड बट अपेयर टू डाइवर्ट फ्रॉम द पॉइंट वेन प्रोड्यूस बैकवर्ड्स An image is thus a point-to-point correspondence with the object established through reflection or refraction. In principle, we can take any two rays emanating from a point on an object, trace their path, find their point of intersection, and thus obtain the image of the point due to reflection at a spherical mirror. In practice, however, it is convenient to choose any two of the following rays. One a ray from the point which is parallel to the principal axis the reflected ray goes through the focus of the mirror two the ray passing through the center of the curvature of a concave mirror or appearing to pass through it for a convex mirror the reflected ray simply retraces the path third the ray passing through or directed towards the focus of the concave mirror or appearing to pass through or directed towards the focus of a convex mirror the reflected ray is parallel to the principal axis fourth the ray incident at any angle at the pole the reflected ray follows the laws of reflection figure 9.5 shows the ray diagram considering three rays it shows the image a dash b dash in this case real if an object ab formed by a concave mirror it does not mean that only three rays emanate from a point a an infinite number of rays emanate from any source in all directions thus point a dash is the image point of a if every ray originating at point a and falling on the concave mirror after the reflection passes through the point a dash we now derive the mirror equation or the relation between the object distance u and the image distance v and the focal length f from the figure 9.5 the two right angle triangle a dash b dash f and m p f are similar for paraxial rays m p can be considered to be a straight line perpendicular to c p therefore b dash a dash by p m is equals to b dash f by f p or b dash a dash by b a is equals to b dash f by f p since angle apb is equals to angle a dash p b dash the right angle triangle a dash b dash p and abp are also similar therefore b dash a dash by b a is equals to b dash p by b p comparing these two equations we get b dash p is equals to minus v fp is equals to minus f and bp is equals to minus u Thus, minus v plus f upon minus f is equals to minus v upon minus u, or one by v plus one by u is equals to one by f. This relation is known as the mirror equation. The size of the image relative to the size of the object is another important quantity to consider. We define linear magnification m as the ratio of the height of the image h dash to the height of the object h. M is equals to h dash h. H and h dash will be taken positive or negative in accordance with the accepted sign convention. In triangles A dash B dash P and A B P, we have B dash A dash by B A is equals to B dash P by B P. with the sign conventions this became m is equals to h dash by h is equals to minus v by u we have derived here the mirror equation equation 9.7 and the magnification formula equation 9.9 for the cases of real inverted image formed by a concave mirror with the proper use of sign convention these are in fact valid for all the cases of reflection by a spherical mirror concave or convex whether the image is formed real or virtual figure 9.6 shows the ray diagram for the virtual image formed by the concave and the convex mirror you should verify the equations 9.7 and 9.9 are valid for these cases as well refraction when a beam of light encounters another transparent medium a part of light gets reflected back into the first medium while the rest enters the other 
a ray of light represents a beam the direction of propagation of an obliquely incident ray of light that enters the another medium changes at interface of the two media this phenomena is called the refraction of light snell's experimentally obtained the following laws of refraction the incident ray the refracted ray and the normal to the interface at the point of incidence all lie in the same plane 2 the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction is constant remember that the angle of incidence i and refraction r are the angles that the incident and the refracted ray makes with the normal respectively we have sin i by sin r is equals to n21 where n21 is a constant called the refractive index of the second medium with respect to the first medium equation 9.10 is well known snell's law of refraction we note that n21 is a characteristic of the pair of media and also depends on the wavelength of light but is independent of the angle of incidence from equation 9.10 If 921 is more than 1, r is less than i. That is the refracted ray bends towards the normal. In such a case, the medium 2 is said to be optically denser or denser in short than medium 1. On the other hand, if the n21 is less than 1, r is greater than i. The refracted ray bends away from the normal. This is the case when the incident ray in a denser medium refracts into a rarer medium. Note optical density should not be confused with mass density which is mass per unit volume. It is possible that mass density of an optically denser medium may be less than that of an optically rarer medium. Optical density is the ratio of the speed of light in the two media. For example, turpentine and water. Mass density of the turpentine is less than that of water, but its optical density is higher. If n21 is the refractive index of the medium 2 with respect to medium 1 and n12 the refractive index of medium 1 with respect to medium 2 then it should be clear that n12 is equals to 1 by n21 it follows that if n32 is the refractive index of the medium 3 with respect to medium 2 then n32 is equals to n31 into n12 where n31 is the refractive index of medium 3 with respect to medium 1 some elementary result based on the laws of refraction follow immediately for a rectangular slab a refraction takes place at two interfaces air glass and glass air it is seen from figure 9.9 that r2 is equals to i1 that is the emergent ray is parallel to the incident ray there is no deviation but it does suffer lateral displacement or shift with respect to the incident ray Another familiar observation is that the bottom of a tank filled with water appears to be raised. For viewing near the normal direction, it can be shown that apparent depth h1 is the real depth divided by refractive index of the medium that is water. The refraction of light through the atmosphere is responsible for many interesting phenomena. For example, the sun is visible a little before the actual sunrise and until a little after the actual sunset due to the refraction of light through the atmosphere by actual sunrise we mean the actual crossing of the horizon by the sun figure 9.11 shows the actual and the apparent position of the sun with respect to the horizon the figure is highly exaggerated to show the effect the refractive index of the air with respect to the vacuum is 1.00029 Due to this the apparent shift in the direction of the sun is about half a degree and the corresponding time difference between the actual sunset and the apparent sunset is about 2 minutes. The apparent flattening oval shape of the sun at the sunset and the sunrise is also due to the same phenomena. The drowning child lifeguard and the Snell's law. Consider a rectangular swimming pool PQSR C in the figure here a lifeguard sitting at the G outside the pool notices the child drowning at the point C the guards wants to reach the child in the shortest possible time let SR be the side of the pool between G and C should he or she take a straight line path 
जी ए सी बिटवीन जी एंड सी और जी बी सी इन विच द पाथ बी सी इन दॉटर शुड बी द शॉर्टेस्ट और सम अदर पाथ लाइक जी एक्स सी द गार्ड नोज दैट हिज और हर रनिंग स्पीड वी वन ऑन द ग्राउंड इज हायर दैन द स्विमिंग पूल वी टू सपोज द गार्ड एंटर्स वॉटर एट एक्स लेट जी एक्स इज इक्वल्स टू एल वन एंड एक्स सी इज इक्वल्स टू एल टू then the time taken to reach from g to c would be t is equals to l1 by v1 plus l2 by v2 to make this time minimum one has to differentiate it with respect to the coordinate of x and find the point x when t is a minimum on doing all this algebra which we skip here we find that the guard should enter the water at a point where snell's law is satisfied To understand this, draw a perpendicular LM to the side SR at x. Let angle GXM is equals to I and angle CXL is equals to R. Then it can be seen that T is minimum when sine I by sine R is equals to V1 by V2. The case of light V1 by V2, the ratio of the velocity of light in the vacuum to that in the medium is the refractive index n of the medium. In short whether it is a wave or a particle or human being whenever two mediums and the two velocities are involved one must follow snell's law if one wants to take the shortest time total internal reflection when light travels from an optically denser medium to a rarer medium at the interface it is partly reflected back to the same medium and partly refracted into the second medium this reflection is called the internal reflection when a ray of light enters from a denser medium to a rarer medium it bends away from the normal for example ray ao1b in figure 9.12 the incident ray ao1 is partly reflected o1c and partly transmitted o1b or refracted the angle of refraction r being the larger and the angle of incidence being smaller Till for the ray AO3 the light of refraction is pi by 2 the refracted ray is bent so much away from the normal that it grazes the surface at the interface between the two media this is shown by the ray AO3d in figure 9.12 if the angle of incidence is increased still further example the ray AO4 refraction is not possible and the incident ray is totally reflected This is called the total internal reflection. When the light gets reflected by a surface, normally some fraction of it gets transmitted. The reflected ray therefore is always less intense than the incident ray. However smooth the reflecting surface may be, the total internal reflection on the other hand, no transmission of light takes place. The angle of incidence corresponding to the angle of refraction 90 degree say angle a o 3 n is called the critical angle for a given pair of media v from snell's law see that if the relative refractive index is less than 1 then since the maximum value of sin r is unity there is an upper limit to the value of sin i for which the law can be satisfied that is i is equals to ic such that sin ic is equals to n21 for values of i larger than ic snell's law of refraction cannot be satisfied and hence no refraction is possible the refractive index of the denser medium 2 with respect to the rarer medium 1 will be n12 is equals to 1 by sin ic some typical critical angles are listed in the table 9.1 a demonstration of total internal reflection All the optical phenomena can be demonstrated very easily with the use of a laser torch or pointer which is easily available nowadays. Take a glass beaker with a clear water in it. Stir the water a few times with a piece of soap so that it becomes a little turbid. Take a laser pointer and shine its beam through the turbid water. You will find that the path of beam inside the water shines brightly. Shine the beam from below the beaker such that it strikes the upper surface of water at the other end. Do you find that it undergoes partial reflection which is seen as a spot on the table below and the partial refraction which comes out in the air and is seen as a spot on the roof? 
Now direct the laser beam from one side of the beaker such that it strikes the upper surface of water more obliquely. Adjust the direction of the laser beam until you find an angle for which the refraction above the water surface is totally absent and the beam is totally reflected back to the water. This is called the total internal reflection at its simplest. Pour this water in a long test tube and shine the laser light from the top. As shown in figure 9.13c, adjust the direction of the laser beam such that it is totally internally reflected every time it strikes the wall of the tube. This is similar to what happens in an optical fiber. Take care not to look into the laser beam directly and not to point it on anybody's face. Total Internal Reflection in Nature and its Technological Application 1. Mirage On hot summer days, the air near the ground becomes hotter than the air at the higher levels. The refractive index of the air increases with its density. Hotter air is less dense and has a smaller refractive index than the cooler air. If the air currents are small, that is the air is still, the optical density at different layers of the air increases with height. As a result, light from a tall object such as a tree passes through a medium whose refractive index decreases towards the ground. Thus, a ray of light from such an object successively bends away from the normal and undergoes total internal reflection. If the angle of incidence for the air near the ground exceeds the critical angle, this is shown in figure 9.14b. To a distant observer, the light appears to be coming from somewhere below the ground. The observer naturally assumes that the light is being reflected from the ground say by a pool of water near the tall objects. Such inverted images of distant tall objects cause an optical illusion to the observer. This phenomena is called the mirage. This type of mirage is especially common in the hot deserts. Some of you might have noticed that while moving in a bus or a car during a hot summer day, a distant patch of road, especially on a highway, appears to be wet. But you do not find any evidence of wetness when you reach at that spot. This is also due to mirage. 2. Diamond Diamonds are known for their spectacular brilliance. Their brilliance is mainly due to the total internal reflection of light inside them. The critical angle for the diamond air interface is approximately 24.4 degrees is very small. Therefore, once a light enters a diamond, it is very likely to undergo total internal reflection inside it. Diamond found in nature rarely exhibit the brilliance for which they are known. It is the technical skill of a diamond cutter which makes the diamond to sparkle so brilliantly. By cutting the diamond suitably, multiple total internal reflections can be made to occur. Third, Prism Prisms designed to bend the light by 90 degree or by 180 degree make use of the total internal reflection. Such a prism is also used to invert images without changing their size. In the first two cases, the critical angle I see for the material of the prism must be less than 45 degrees. We see from the table 9.1 that this is true for both ground glass and the dense flint glass. Fourth, Optical fibers Nowadays, optical fibers are extensively used for transmitting audio and video signals through long distances. Optical fibers to make use of the phenomena of total internal reflection. Optical fibers are fabricated with high-quality composite glass or quartz fibers. Each fiber consists of a core and cladding. The refractive index of the material of core is higher than that of the cladding. When a signal in the form of a light is directed at one end of the fiber, at a suitable angle, it undergoes repeated total internal reflections along the length of the fiber and finally comes out at the other end. Since light undergoes total internal reflection at each stage, there is no appreciable loss in the intensity of the light signal. Optical fibers are fabricated such that light reflected at one side of the inner surface strikes at the other at an angle larger than the critical angle. Even if the fire is bent, light can easily travel along its length. 
Thus, an optical fiber can be used to act as an optical pipe. The bundle of the optical fibers can be put to several uses. Optical fibers are extensively used for transmitting and receiving electrical signals, which are converted to light by suitable transducers. Obviously, optical fibers can also be used for transmission of optical signals. For example, these are used as a light pipe to facilitate visual examination of internal organs like esophagus, stomach and intestines. You might have seen a commonly available decorative lamp with fine plastic fibers with their free ends forming a fountain-like structure. The other end of the fibers is fixed over the electric lamp. When the lamp is switched on, the light travels from the bottom of each fiber and appears at the tip of its free end as a dot of light. The fiber in such decorative lamps are optical fibers. The main requirement in fabricating optical fibers is that there should be a very little absorption of light as it travels for long distances inside them. This has been achieved by purification and special preparation of materials such as quartz. In silica glass fibers, it is possible to transmit more than 95% of the light over a fiber length of 1 km. Compare with what you expect for a block of ordinary glass window 1 km thick. Refraction at spherical surface and by lenses. We have so far considered refraction at the plane interface. We shall now consider refraction at a spherical interface between two transparent media. An infinitesimal part of the spherical surface can be regarded as the planar and the sum loss of refraction can be applied at every point on the surface. Just as for the reflection by the spherical mirror, the normal of the point of the incidence is perpendicular to the tangent plane to the spherical surface at that point and therefore passes through its center of curvature. We first consider refraction by a single spherical surface and follow it by a thin lens. A thin lens is a transparent optical medium bounded by two surfaces, at least one of which should be spherical. Applying the formula of the image formation by a single spherical surface successively at two surfaces of a lens, we shall obtain the lens maker's formula and then the lens formula. Refraction at a spherical surface. Figure 9.17 shows the geometry of formation of image I of an object O on the principal's axis of a spherical surface with the center of curvature C and radius of curvature R. The rays are incident from a medium of refractive index N1 to another of refractive index N2. As before, we take the aperture or the lateral size of the surface to be small compared to the other distances involved so that a small angle approximation can be made. In particular, Nm will be taken to be nearly equal to the length of the perpendicular from the point N on the principal axis. We have for small angles tan angle NOM is equals to MN by OM, tan angle NCM is equals to MN by MC, tan Angle NIM is equals to MN by MI. Now, for triangle NOC, I is the exterior angle. Therefore, I is equals to MN by OM plus MN by MC. Similarly, R is equals to MN by MC minus MN by MI. Now, by Snell's law, N1 into I is equals to N2R. Substituting I and R from the equations, N1 by OM plus N2 by MI is equals to N2 minus N1 by MC. Substituting these equations we get N2 by V minus N1 by U is equals to N2 minus N1 by R. This equation gives us a relation between the object and image distance in terms of the refractive index of the medium and the radius of the curvature of the curved spherical surface. It holds for any curved spherical surface. Fraction by Lens Figure 9.18a shows the geometry of image formation by a double convex lens. The image formation can be seen in terms of two steps. First. 
The first refracting surface forms the image I1 of the object O. The image I1 acts as a virtual object for the second surface that forms the image at I. Applying equation 9.15 to the first interface ABC, we get N1 by OB plus N2 by B1 is equals to N2 minus N1 by BC1. A similar procedure applied to the second interface ADC gives minus N2 by DI1 plus N1 by DI is equals to N2 minus N1 by DC2. For a thin lens, BI1 is equals to DI1. Adding these equations, we get N1 by F is equals to N2 minus N1 into 1 by BC1 plus 1 by DC2. The point where image of an object placed at infinity is formed is called the focus F. And the distance F gives its focal length. A lens has two foci F and F dash on the either side of it. By the sign convention, BC1 is equals to plus R1, DC2 is equals to minus R2. So, by this equation, we get the lens maker's formula. It is useful to design lenses of the desired focal length using surface of suitable radii of curvature. Note that the formula is true for a concave lens also. In that case, R1 is negative, R2 is positive, therefore F is negative. And in thin lens approximation, B and D are both close to the optical center of the lens and applying the convention 1 by V minus 1 by U is equals to 1 by F. This equation is the familiar thin lens formula. Though we have derived it for a real image formed by a convex lens, the formula is valid for both convex as well as the concave lenses and for both real and the virtual images. It is worth mentioning that the two foci F and F dash of a double concave and the convex lenses are equidistant from the optical center. The focus on the side of the original source of light is called the first focal point, whereas the other is called the second focal point. To find the image of an object by a lens, we can in principle take any two rays emanating from a point on an object. Trace their paths using the laws of refraction and find the point where the refracted rays meet or appear to meet. In practice, however, it is convenient to choose any two of the following rays. 1. A ray emanating from the object parallel to the principal axis of lens after refraction passes through the second principal focus F dash in a convex lens or appears to diverge in a concave lens from the first principal focus F. 2. A ray of light passing through the optical center of the lens emerges without any deviation after refraction. 3. A ray of light passing through the first principal focus for convex lens or appearing to meet at it for a concave lens emerges parallel to the principal axis after refraction. Figure 9.19a and b illustrates these rules for a convex and a concave lens respectively. You should practice drawing similar ray diagram for different positions of the object with respect to the lenses and also verify that the lens formula equation 9.23 holds good for all cases. Here again it must be remembered that each point on an object gives out infinite number of rays. All these rays will pass through the same image point after refraction at the lens. Magnification M produced by a lens is defined like that for a mirror as the ratio of the size of the image to that of the object. Proceeding in the same way as for the spherical mirrors, it is easily seen that for a lens M is equals to H dash by H is equals to V by U. We apply the sign convention, we see that for erect and virtual image formed by the convex or concave lens M is positive while for an inverted and real image M is negative. Power of a lens Power of a lens is a measure of convergence or divergence which a lens introduces in the light falling on it. Clearly. A lens of shorter focal length bends the incident light more while converging it. 
in the case of a convex lens and diverging it in the case of a concave lens. The power P of a lens is defined as the tangent of the angle by which it converges or diverges a beam of light falling at the unit distance from the optical center. Tan delta is equals to H by F if H is equals to 1. Tan delta is equals to 1 by F or delta is equals to 1 by F for small values of delta. Thus, P is equals to 1 by F. The SI units of power of a lens is diopter. One diopter is equals to 1 meter inverse. The power of a lens of the focal length of 1 meter is 1 diopter. Power of a lens is positive for a converging lens and negative for a diverging lens. Thus, when an optician prescribes a corrective lens of power plus 2.5D, the required lens is a convex lens of focal length plus 40 cm. A lens of power of minus 4.0D means a concave lens of focal length minus 25 cm. Combination of thin lenses in contact. Consider two lenses A and B of focal length F1 and F2 placed in contact with each other. Let the object be placed at a point O beyond the focus of the first lens A. The first lens produces an image at I1. Since image I1 is real, it serves as a virtual object for second lens P, producing the final image at I. It must however be borne in mind that formation of image by the first lens is presumed only to facilitate determination of the position of the final image. In fact, the direction of the rays emerging from the first lens get modified in accordance with the angle at which they strike the second lens. Since the lens are thin, we assume that the optical centers of the lens to be coincident. Let the central point be denoted by P. For the image formed by the first lens A, we get 1 by V1 minus 1 by U is equals to 1 by F1. For the image formed by the second lens B, we get 1 by V minus 1 by V1 is equals to 1 by F2. Adding these equations, we get 1 by V minus 1 by U is equals to F. So we get 1 by F is equals to 1 by F1 plus 1 by F2. The derivation is valid for any number of thin lenses in contact. If several thin lenses of focal length F1, F2, F3 and so on are in contact, the effective focal length of their combination is given by 1 by F is equals to 1 by F1 plus 1 by F2 plus 1 by F3 and so on. In the terms of the power, it can be written as P is equals to P1 plus P2 plus P3 and so on where P is the net power of the lens combination. Note that the sum in equation 9.32 is an algebraic sum of the individual powers, so some of the terms of the right side may be positive for convex lens and some negative for the concave lens. Combination of the lenses helps to obtain diverging or converging lenses of desired magnification. It also enhances sharpness of the image. Since the image formed by the first lens becomes the object for the second, equation 9.25 implies that the total magnification M of the combination is a product of magnification M1, M2, M3 and so on of individual lenses, that is M is equals to M1 into M2 into M3 and so on. Such a system of combination of lenses is commonly used in designing lenses for cameras, microscopes, telescopes and other optical instruments. Refraction through a prism Figure 9.23 shows the passage of light through a triangular prism ABC. The angle of incidence and refraction at the first face AB are I and R1, while the angle of incidence from glass to air at the second face AC is R2, and the angle of refraction or emergence E, the angle between the emergent ray RS and the direction of the incident ray PQ is called the angle of deviation delta. In the quadrilateral AQ and R, two of the angles at the vertices Q and R are the right angles. Therefore, the sum of the other angles of the quadrilateral is 180 degrees. From triangle Q and R, R1 plus R2 
plus angle Q and R is equals to 180 degrees. Comparing these two equations, we get R1 plus R2 is equals to A. And the total deviation is I plus E minus A. Thus, the angle of deviation depends on the angle of incidence. A plot between the angle of deviation and the angle of incidence is shown in figure 9.24. You can see that in general, any given value of delta except for i is equals to e corresponds to two values i and hence of e. This in fact is expected from the symmetry of i and e in equation 9.35. That is, delta remains the same if i and e are interchanged. Physically, these are related to the fact that the path of the ray in figure 9.23 can be traced back resulting in the same angle of deviation. At the minimum deviation dm, the refracted ray inside the prism becomes parallel to its base. We have delta is equals to dm, i is equals to e which implies r1 is equals to r2. Equation 9.34 gives 2R is equals to A or R is equals to A by 2. In the same way, equation 9.35 gives DM is equals to 2I minus A. Refractive index of the prism is N21 is equals to N2 by N1 is equals to sin A plus DM by 2 upon sin A by 2. The angle A and D can be measured experimentally. For a small angle prism, that is a thin prism, dm is also very small and we get n21 is equals to a plus dm by 2 upon a by 2. dm is equals to n21 minus 1 into a. This implies that thin prisms do not deviate light much. Dispersion by a prism it has been known for a long time that when a narrow beam of sunlight, usually called the white light, is incident on a glass prism, the emergent light is seen to be consisting of various colors. There is actually a continuous variation of color, but broadly. The different component colors that appear in a sequence are violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red, given by an acronym VIBCURE. The red light bends the least and the violet bends the most. The phenomena of a splitting of light into its component colors is known as dispersion. The pattern of the color component of light is called the spectrum of light. The word spectrum is now used in a much more gentle sense. We discussed in chapter 8 the electromagnetic spectrum over the large range of wavelengths, from gamma rays to radio waves of which the spectrum of light visible spectrum is only a small part. Though the reason for appearance of a spectrum is now common knowledge, it was a matter of much debate in the history of physics. Does the prism itself create colors in some way or does it only separate the colors already present in the white light? In a classical experiment known for its simplicity but its great significance, Isaac Newton settled the issue once for all. He put another similar prism but in an inverted position and let the emergent beam from the prism fall on the second prism. The resulting emergent beam was found to be white light. The explanation was clear. The first prism splits the white light into its component colors while the inverted prism recombines them gives a white light. Thus, white light itself consists of light of different colors which are separate by a prism. It must be understood that here the ray of light as defined mathematically does not exist. An actual ray is really a beam of many rays of light. Each ray splits into the components of colors when it enters a glass prism. When those colored rays come out on the other side, they again produce a white beam. We now know that the color is associated with wavelength of light. In the visible spectrum, red light is at the long wavelength end that is approximately equal to 700 nanometers while the violet light is at the short wavelength end that is approximately equal to 400 nanometers. Dispersion takes place because the refractive index of medium of different wavelengths is different. For example, 
The bending of red component of white light is least while it is most for the violet light. Equivalently, red light travels faster than the violet light in a glass prism. Table 9.2 gives the refractive indices for different wavelengths for crown glass and flint glass. Thick lens should be assumed as made of many prisms. Therefore, thick lens show chromatic abrasions due to the dispersion of light. The variation of refractive index with the wavelength may be more pronounced in some media than the other. In vacuum, of course, the speed of light is independent of wavelength. This vacuum or air approximately is a non-dispersive medium in which all colors travel with the same speed. This also follows from the fact that sunlight reaches us in the form of white light and not as its components. On the other hand, glass is a dispersive medium. Some natural phenomena due to sunlight. The interplay of light with things around us gives rise to several beautiful phenomena. The spectacle of colors which we see around us all the time is possible only due to sunlight. The blue of the sky, the white clouds, the red hue at sunrise and sunset, the rainbow, the brilliant colors of some pearls, shells and wings of birds are just a few of the natural wonders we are used to. We describe some of them here from the point of view of physics. The rainbow the rainbow is an example of the dispersion of sunlight by water drops in atmosphere. This is a phenomena due to combined effect of dispersion, refraction and reflection by sunlight by spherical water droplets of rain. The condition for observing a rainbow are that a sun should be shining in one part of the sky, say near western horizon, while it is raining in the opposite part of the sky, say eastern horizon. An observer can therefore see a rainbow only when his back is towards the sun. In order to understand the formation of rainbows, consider figure 9.27a. Sunlight is first refracted as it enters a raindrop, which causes the different wavelength or colors of white light to separate. Longer wavelengths of light, red, are bent to the least while the shorter wavelength, violet, are bent to the most. Next, these component rays strike the inner surface of the water drop and get internally reflected if the angle between the refracted ray and normal to the drop surface is greater than the critical angle, 48 degrees in this case. The reflected light is refracted again as it comes out of the drop as shown in the figure. It is found that the violet light emerges at an angle of 40 degrees related to the incoming sunlight and red light emerges at an angle of 42 degrees. For other colors, angles lie between the, these two lines. Figure 9.27b explains the formation of primary rainbow. We see that the red light from drop 1 and the violet light from drop 2 reaches the observer's eye. The violet from the drop 1 and the red light from the drop 2 are directed at level above or below the observer. Thus the observer sees a rainbow with the red color on the top and the violet on the bottom. Thus the primary rainbow is a result of three step process that is refraction, reflection and refraction. When light rays undergoes two internal reflections inside a raindrop instead of one in the primary rainbow, the second rainbow is formed as shown in figure 9.27c. It is due to the four-step process. The intensity of light is reduced at the second reflection and hence the secondary rainbow is fainter than the primary rainbow. Further, the order of the colors is reversed in it as in a clear form, figure 9.27c. A scattering of light as sunlight travels through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets scattered, changes its directions by the atmospheric particles. Light of shorter wavelengths is scattered much more than light of longer wavelengths. The amount of scattering is inversely proportional to the fourth power of wavelength. This is known as the Rayleigh scattering. Hence, the bluish color predominates in the clear sky. Since blue has a shorter wavelength, 
than the red and is scattered much more strongly. In fact, violet gets scattered even more than blue, having a shorter wavelength. But since our eyes are more sensitive to blue than violet, we see the blue sky. Large particles like dust and water droplets present in the atmosphere behave differently. The relevant quantity here is the relative size of the wavelength of light lambda and the scatterer of typical size A for A much much less than lambda. One has really a scattering which is proportional to 1 by lambda whole square. For A much much greater than lambda, that is large scattering particles, for example raindrops, large dust or ice particles, this is not true. All wavelengths are scattered nearly equally. These clouds which have droplets of water with A much much greater than lambda are generally white. At sunset or sunrise, the sun's rays have to pass through a larger distance in the atmosphere. Most of the blue and the other shorter wavelengths are removed by scattering. The least scattered light reaching our eyes, therefore, the sun looks reddish. This explains the reddish appearance of the sun and the full moon near the horizon. Optical Instruments A number of optical devices and instruments have been designed utilizing reflecting and refracting properties of mirrors, lenses and prisms. Periscope Kaleidoscope, binoculars, telescope, microscopes are some examples of the devices and instruments that are in common use. Our eye is of course one of the most important optical device the nature has endowed us with. Starting with the eye, we then go to describe the principle of working of the microscope and telescope. The eye in figure 9.29a shows the eye. Light enters the eye through a curved front surface, cornea. It passes through the pupil, which is the central hole in the iris. The size of the pupil can change under control of muscles. The light is further focused by the eye lens on the retina. The retina is a film of nerve fibers covering the curved back surface of the eye. The retina contains rods and cones, which sense light, intensity and color respectively and transmit electric signals via the optic nerves to the brain which finally processes this information. The shape or curvature and therefore the focal length of the lens can be modified somewhat by ciliary muscles. For example, when the muscle is relaxed, the focal length is about 2.5 cm and the objects at infinity are in sharp focus on retina. When the object is brought closer to eye, in order to maintain same image lens distance, the focal length of eye lens becomes shorter by the action of the ciliary muscles. This property of the eye is called accommodation. If the object is too close to the eye, the lens cannot curve enough to focus the image onto the retina and the image is blurred. The closest distance for which the lens can focus light on the retina is called the least distance of distinct vision or the near point. The standard value of the normal vision is taken as 25 cm. Often near point is given the symbol D. The distance D increases with age because of the decreasing effectiveness of the ciliary muscles and loss of the flexibility of the lens. The near point may be close as about 7 to 8 centimeters in a child 10 years of age and may increase to as much as 200 centimeters at 60 years of age. Thus, if an elderly person tries to read a book at about 25 centimeters from the eye, the image appears blurred. This condition or the defect of eye is called the press biopia. It is corrected by using a converging lens for reading. Thus, our eyes are marvelous organs that have the capability to interpret incoming electromagnetic waves as images through a complex process. These are greatest asset and we must take proper care to protect them. Imagine the world without a pair of functional eye. Yet many amongst us bravely face this challenge by effectively overcoming their limitations to lead a normal life. They deserve our appreciation for their courage and conviction. In spite of all precautions and proactive actions, our eyes may develop some defects due to various reasons. 
we shall restrict our discussion to some common optical defects of the eye. For example, the light from a distant object arriving at the eye lens may get converged at a point in front of retina. This type of a defect is known as nearsightedness or the myopia. This means that the eye is producing too much convergence in the incident beam. To compensate this, we interpose a concave lens between the eye and the object, with diverging effect desired to get the image focused on the retina. Similarly, if the eye lens focuses the incoming light at a point behind the retina, a convergent lens is needed to compensate for the defect in vision. This defect is called the farsightedness or the hypermetropia. Another common defect of the vision is called the astigmatism. This occurs when the cornea is not spherical in shape. For example, the cornea could have a larger curvature in the vertical plane than in the horizontal plane or vice versa. If a person with such a defect in eye lens looks at a wire mesh or a grid of lines focusing in either the vertical or the horizontal plane may not be as sharp as in the other plane. Astigmatism results in the lines in one direction being well focused while those in a perpendicular direction may appear distorted. Astigmatism can be corrected by using a cylindrical lens of a desired radius of curvature with an appropriately directed axis. This effect can occur along with myopia or heteromyopia. The Microscope A simple magnifier or a microscope is a converging lens of a small focal length. In order to use such a lens as a microscope, the lens is held near the object one focal length away or less and the eye is positioned close to the lens on the other side. The idea is to get an erect magnified and virtual image of the object at a distance so that it can be viewed comfortably, that is at 25 centimeters or more. If the object is at a distance f, the image is at infinity. However, if the image is at a distance slightly less than the focal length of the lens, the virtual image is closer than infinity. Although the closest comfortable distance for viewing the image is when it is at the near point, distance that is equal to 25 cm, it causes some strain on the eye. Therefore, the image formed at the infinity is often considered most suitable for viewing by the relaxed eye. We show both cases, in first in figure 9.30a and second in the 9.30b and c. The linear magnification m for the image formed at the near point d by a simple microscope can be obtained by using the relation m is equals to v by u is equals to v into 1 by v minus 1 by f is equals to 1 minus v by f. Now, according to our sign convention, V is negative and equal in magnitude to D. Thus, the magnification is M is equals to 1 plus D by F. Since D is about 25 centimeters to have a magnification of 6, one needs a convex lens of focal length F is equals to 5 centimeters. Note that M is equals to H dash by H where h is the size of the object and h dash is the size of the image. This is also the ratio of the angle substantiated by the image to that substantiated by the object, if placed at d for comfortable viewing. What a single lens simple magnifier achieves is that it allows the object to be brought close to the eye than d. We will now find the magnification when the image is at infinity. In this case, we will have to obtain the angular magnification. Suppose the object has a height h, the maximum angle it can substand and can be clearly visible without a lens is when it is at the near point, that is a distance d. The angle substanded is then given by tan theta naught is equals to h by d is equals to approximately theta naught. We now find the angle substanded at the eye by the image when the object is at u. From the relations, h dash by h is equals to m is equals to v by u 
we have the angle subtended by the image tan theta i is equals to h dash by minus v is equals to h dash by minus v into v by u is equals to h dash by minus u is approximately equal to theta the angle subtended by the object when it is at u is equals to minus f theta i is equals to h by f as is clear from figure 9.29c the angular magnification is therefore m is equals to theta i upon theta naught this is one less than the magnification when the image is at the near point that is equation 3.39 but the viewing is more comfortable and the difference in magnification is usually small in subsequent discussions of the optical instrument microscope and telescope we shall assume the image to be at infinity a simple microscope has a limited maximum magnification that is equal to or less than 9 for the realistic focal lens. For much larger magnifications, one uses two lenses, one compounding the effect of the other. This is known as the compound microscope. A schematic diagram of the compound microscope is shown in the figure. The lens nearest to the object is called the objective forms a real inverted and magnified image of the object. This serves as the object for the second lens, the eyepiece, which functions essentially like a simple microscope or a magnifier and produces a final image which is enlarged and virtual. The first inverted image is thus near, at or within the focal plane of the eyepiece at a distance appropriate for the final image formation at infinity or a little closer for the image formation at the near point. Clearly, the final image is inverted with respect to the original object. We now obtain the magnification due to a compound microscope. The ray diagram of the figure 9.31 shows the linear magnification due to the objective namely h dash by h that is equal to m0 where we have used the result tan beta is equals to h by f0 is equals to h dash by l here h dash is the size of the first image the object size being h and the f0 being the focal length of the objective the first image is formed near the focal point of the eyepiece the distance l that is the distance between the second focal point of the objective and the first focal point of the eyepiece is called the tube length of the compound microscope. As the first inverted image is near the focal point of the eyepiece, we use the result from the discussion above for the simple microscope to obtain the angular magnification Me due to it. When the final image is formed at a near point, is Me is equals to 1 plus d by fe when the final image is formed at infinity the angular magnification due to the eyepiece is me is equals to d by fe thus the total magnification when image is formed at infinity is m is equals to m naught into me is equals to l by f naught into d by fe clearly to achieve a large magnification of a small object hence the name microscope the objective and the eyepiece should have small focal lengths. In practice, it is difficult to make the focal length much smaller than 1 cm. Also, large lenses are required to make L large. For example, with an objective with F0 is equals to 1 cm and an eyepiece with focal length Fe is equals to 2 cm and a tube length of 20 cm, the magnification is m is equals to m0 me is equals to l by f0 into d by f0 is equals to 250. Various other factors such as illumination of the object contribute to the quality and the visibility of the image. In modern microscope, multi-component lenses are used for both the objective and the eyepiece to improve the image quality by minimizing various optical aberrations and defects in the lenses. Telescope The telescope is used to provide angular magnification of the distant objects. It also has an objective and an eyepiece. But here the objective has a large focal length and a much larger aperture than the eyepiece. Light from a distant object enters the objective as a real image is formed 
in the tube and its second focal point. The eyepiece magnifies this image producing a final inverted image. The magnifying power M is the ratio of the angle beta subtended at the eye by the final image to the angle alpha which the object subtends at the lens or the eye. Hence, M is approximately equal to beta by alpha is approximately equal to H by Fe into F0 by H is equals to F0 by Fe. In this case, the length of the telescope tube is F0 plus Fe. Terrestrial telescopes have, in addition, a pair of inverting lenses to make the final image erect. Refracting telescopes can be used both for terrestrial and astronomical observations. For example, consider a telescope whose objective has a focal length of 100 cm and the eyepiece a focal length of 1 cm. The magnifying power of this telescope is m is equals to 100 by 1. Let us consider the pair of a star of actual separation 1 minute, 1 minute of arc. The stars appear as though they are separated by an angle of 1.67 degrees. The main considerations with an astronomical telescope are its light gathering power and its resolution or resolving power. The former clearly depends on the area of the objective. With large diameters, fainter objects can be observed. The resolving power or the ability to observe two objects distinctly which are very nearly the same directions also depends on the diameter of the objective. So the desirable aim in optical telescope is to make them with objective of large diameter. The largest lens objective in use has a diameter of 40 inch that is approximately equal to 1.02 meters. It is at the Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin, USA. Such big lenses tend to be very heavy and therefore difficult to make and support by their edges. Further, it is rather difficult and expensive to make such large sized lenses which form images that are free from any kind of chromatic abrasions and distortions. For these reasons, modern telescopes use a concave mirror rather than a lens for the objective. Telescopes with mirror objectives are called reflecting telescopes. They have several advantages. First, there is no chromatic abrasion in a mirror. Second, if a parabolic reflecting surface is chosen, spherical abrasions can also be removed. Mechanical support is much less of a problem since the mirror weighs much less than a lens of the equivalent optical quality and can be supported over its entire back surface, not over just its rim. One obvious problem with a reflecting telescope is that the objective mirror focuses the light inside the telescope tube. One must have an eyepiece and the observer light there, obstructing some light depending on the size of the observer cage. This is what is done in a very large 200 inch diameter. MT Plomer Telescope at California. The viewer sits near the focal point of the mirror in a small cage. Another solution to the problem is to deflect the light being focused by another mirror. One such arrangement using a convex secondary mirror to focus the incident light which now passes through a hole in the objective primary mirror is shown in the figure 9.33. This is known as a Cassegrain telescope after its inventor. It has the advantages of large focal length in a short telescope. The largest telescope in India is in Kavalur, Tamil Nadu. It has a 2.34 meter diameter reflecting telescope. It was ground, polished, set up and is being used by Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. The largest reflecting telescopes in the world are a pair of Keck telescope in Hawaii, USA, with a reflector of 10 meters in diameter. Summary 1. Reflection is governed by the equation angle I is equal to angle R dash and the refraction by the Snell's law sin I by sin R is equal to N where incident ray, reflected ray, refracted ray and the normal lie in the same plane. 2. 
the critical angle of incidence IC for a ray incident from a denser to a rarer medium is that angle for which the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. For I more than IC, the total internal reflection occurs. Multiple internal reflections in diamond IC is approximately equal to 24.4 degrees. Totally reflecting prisms and mirage are some examples of total internal reflections. Optical fibers consist of glass fibers coated with a thin layer of material of lower refractive index. Light incident at an angle at one end comes out at the other after multiple internal reflections even if the fiber is bent. Third, Cartesian sign convention. Distance measured in the same direction as the incident light are positive. Those measured in the opposite directions are negative. All distances are measured from pole or optic center of the mirror or lens on the principal axis. The heights measured upwards above the x-axis and normal to the principal axis of the mirror or lens are taken as positive. The heights measured downwards are taken as negative. Fourth, Mirror Equation 1 by V plus 1 by U is equals to 1 by F, where U and V are the object and the image distances respectively, and F is the focal length of the mirror. F is approximately half the radius of the curvature R. F is negative for concave mirror. F is positive for a convex mirror. 5. For a prism of the angle A of a refractive index N2 placed in a medium of refractive index N1, N21 is equal to N2 upon N1. That is equal to sin a plus dm by 2 upon sin a by 2 where dm is the angle of minimum deviation 6 for refraction through a spherical interface from medium 1 to 2 of refractive index n1 and n2 respectively thin lens formula is 1 by v minus 1 by u is equals to 1 by f lens makers formula is 1 by f is equals to n2 minus n1 upon n1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. r1 and r2 are the radii of curvature of the lens surface. f is positive for a converging lens, f is negative for a diverging lens. The power of a lens is power is equals to 1 by f. The SI unit of the power of a lens is diopters d1 diopter is equals to 1 per meter. In several thin lenses, the focal length f1, f2, f3 are in contact. The effective focal length of their combination is given by 1 by f is equals to 1 by f1 plus 1 by f2 and so on. The total power of the combination of the several lenses is p is equals to p1 plus p2 and so on. Seventh, dispersion is the splitting of the light into its constituent colors. Eighth, the eye. The eye has a convex lens of focal length of about 2.5 cm. This focal length can be varied somewhat so that the image is always formed on the retina. This ability of the light is called the accommodation. In a defective eye, if the image is focused before the retina, called myopia, a diverging corrective lens is needed. If the image is focused beyond the retina, that is called the hypermetropia, a converging corrective lens is needed. Astigmatism is corrected by using a cylindrical lens. Ninth, magnifying power M of a simple microscope is given by M is equals to 1 plus D by F, where D is equals to 25 centimeters is the least distance of distinct vision. And F is the focal length of the convex lens. If the image is at infinity, m is equals to d by f. For a compound microscope, the magnifying power is given by m is equals to m e into m naught, where m e is equals to 1 plus d by f e is the magnification due to the eyepiece and m o is the magnification produced by the objective approximately m is equals to l by f naught into d by f e, where F0 and Fe are the focal length of the objective and the eyepiece respectively, and L is the distance between their focal points. Tenth, 
magnifying power m of a telescope is the ratio of the angle b subtended by the i by the image to the angle alpha subtended by the i by the object m is equals to beta by alpha is equals to f not by f e points to ponder 1 the laws of reflection and refraction are true for all surface and the pair of media at a point of incidence 2 The real image of an object placed between the f and 2f from a convex lens can be seen on a screen placed at the image location. If the screen is removed, is the image still there? This question puzzles many because it is difficult to reconcile ourselves with an image suspended in air without a screen, but the image does exist. Rays from a given point on the object are converging to an image point in the space and diverging away. The screen simply diffuses these rays some of which reaches our eye and we see the image this can be seen by the image formed in the air during a laser show 3 image formation needs regular reflection and refraction in principle all rays from a given point should reach the same image point This is why you do not see your image by an irregular reflecting object say a page of a book fourth Thick lenses give colored images due to dispersion. The variety in the color of objects we see around is due to the constituent colors of the light incident on them. A monochromatic light may be produced an entirely different perception about the colors on an object as seen in the white light. 5. For a simple microscope, the angular size of the object equals the angular size of the image. yet it offers magnification because we can keep a small object much closer to eye than 25 cm and hence have it subtended a large angle the image is at 25 cm which we can see without the microscope you would need to keep the small object at 25 cm which would subtend a very small angle